We're joined now by NHL insider Frank Saravelli of the Daily Faceoff, the Frankly Speaking podcast. I'm told Quadrelli calls you. No, don't say it. Don't do it. Don't do don't, it. Don't do it. No, it's bad. I don't want to hear that. I get, I get very squeamish. All right. He thinks Wendy. it's funny, though. All these kids, are they think it's funny. <laughs> they give you nicknames. They think it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Did I tell you Quadrelli broke our chair in here? Broke, broke my chair. I mean, look, I'm a big dude, and I was in there, and I didn't break it. Exactly. So I feel good about that. How does a waif of a guy like David Quadrelli break the chair? 78 pound David Quadrelli uh -huh. breaks yeah. chair. Yeah, doesn't hmm. seem right. Tell us how the Nikita's the door off deal got done with the Canucks. What an absolute fortunate spot the Canucks were in this week. Everything comes together. Think about it from this perspective. They've been trying to move. Anthony Beauvillier for a while now. They can't find any traction or thinking that they probably have to attach a piece in order for a team to take on his contract. They're dying for cap flexibility. And Taylor Hall goes out for the season and Corey Perry gets his contract terminated. And all of a sudden, the Chicago Blackhawks, after their face of their franchise was getting blasted on social media as shrapnel, just, you know, a pure bystander here. And then you have the on ice portion of it also eroding away the support factor that you tried to bring into place for your, you know, unbelievable talent that you have in your lineup as an 18 year old. They say, you know what? We could actually take a flyer on Beauvillier. So we're going to give you a fifth round pick and the Canucks are thrilled. Now, for the first time, as mentioned in Patrick Alvin and Jim Rutherford's tenure, they have cap flexibility and freedom. And, oh, by the way, we're going to take that fifth round pick that Chicago gave us, add in a third and get a six foot six defenseman who's mean, who can move. And we can finally provide some proper support again in our defensive lineup that had suddenly withered away after we talked all preseason guys about the biggest change for me for the Canucks this year was the fact that they had Philip Peronic for a full year, Carson Soucy, Ian Cole, and all of a sudden you get back into the same ugly spot you were in where you're playing, no offense, Noah Juleson, Cole McWard, and you can directly correlate the sort of, you know, valleys in the Canucks season to this point to a shortened, thin lineup. And now you can bring in Zadaroff and shore that up again. Some tidy, tidy work being done. Who else was involved here, Frank? Who did they beat out? Well, I think they were in a spot where, <clears throat> excuse me, first off, the Calgary Flames, as much as they valued whatever they got in return, in talking to some people in Calgary, they really wanted to quiet down a lot of what was out there, just drama-wise, noise-wise. and. It took a team meeting from Captain Michael Backlund to go through and say, enough of this stuff, enough of trade requests coming through the media. If you've got a problem, take it up with Flames management directly. So the Calgary Flames and Craig Conroy are too classy. They're too polite to throw dirt on Nikita Zadarov on the way out. But I think that was a certain part of this deal. Yes, the pick is fine. I think if the Flames had hung on to Zadarov until March 8th, they probably get a second but they get cap flexibility in the meantime, not having to retain on Zadaroff. And also they limit some of that noise. And I think for a team that's trying to climb back into the playoff race, that's pretty key. So who do they beat out? I think there's no question that the Toronto Maple Leafs had sniffed around, but what Toronto is trying to accomplish is trying to bring in two defensemen for what, they're losing in John Klingberg and his salary. So they couldn't take on all of Zadarov's money. They wanted the, the Flames to retain. And same thing with some other teams. I think New Jersey had checked in. Of those teams that had been in the mix, they all were looking for the Flames to retain. And that kind of defeats the purpose because if you've got other pending UFAs that you'd like to move, well, then you probably want to make sure that you have enough retention spots to be able to do that. Does, does yeah. it concern you looking at the Canucks that Milstein's got some prominent client? Like, does it ever concern you when one agent's got a bunch of players on one team? Does that change the dynamic at all? Not really. I mean, nope. the nature of this league is that I'd say 70% of the league, it feels like, is either represented by Newport Sports or CAA. It's probably mm. a 
a, a slightly smaller number, but on any given team, there's like five clients from Newport, you know, three or five from CAA. So it feels like they have a huge chunk of the league. And I don't, I think in certain markets you worry about, um, you know, sort of one agency kind of controlling things and, you know, maybe that's a real thing. Maybe it isn't, but with the case of, um, the Canucks, so it's Mikheyev, Kuzmenko, Zadarov. Am I missing anyone? Mm, no, I think it's different. It's, it's not thing. enough to, yeah. to I think, turn the yeah. tide or anything yeah. and, and offer some sort of proxy control, if that's what you're thinking. Big question here, Frank. Look, uh, Zadorov um, helps regardless, because as you mentioned, look at some of the defensemen who they were playing and talk and said, we're playing some guys too many minutes, and that's obviously Hughes and Hronick. But do you believe he can be a top four right side defenseman on his off uh, his offhand? In a perfect world, I don't. I think he's a third pair defenseman, and I think that more or less that was what limited the return for the Calgary Flames. Is that enough teams around him view him as a nice? complimentary piece that can provide a different element, some size and physicality, but ultimately at the end of the day, whether it's through minutes played mistakes made contribution to different units um, that he's really trending more towards a third pair guy when slotted correctly on a true sort of contending team. So maybe if the Canucks are asking him to play second pair, it kind of gives you some window into my thought process in terms of, where the Canucks are at and getting to that level. And you saw that measuring stick game on Thursday night against the Golden Knights. Um, the Canucks have made huge strides. There's no doubt about that. And I think if you're a Canucks fan, you've got to be thrilled about where this team is at. But I still think there's a real clear separation to me between the Golden Knights and the Los Angeles Kings and then the Canucks one level below that. So are they, you've been as bullish on the Canucks as anyone. Do you, you don't consider them a contender then? I think my contender group is like pretty small. I think it's six to seven teams and I've had the Canucks as a firm playoff team the whole time that hasn't wavered. I'm not saying that they can't continue to make additions to get there, but I think that they're the next rung down from being a contender. A big thing that would make them contenders would be to flesh out this blue line even more. And of course there's a lot of uh, knocking on the door of Ethan bear and, and, it doesn't sound like they're out of that. Uh, and, and it's not like Ethan Bear has got a, a ton of leverage league wide. He is open to sign anywhere. But, you know, coming off a, a big injury like this, he probably wants to stay as comfortable as he can here. Do you think they still go down the Ethan Bear Boulevard here uh, despite this addition? I don't know why you wouldn't. I mean, he's free depth, is the way I look at it. Like, if Ethan Bear can get back to a level commensurate to what he was at, a few years ago, then I view that. And again, I don't mean to be picking on anyone, but I view that as a, a slight level above Juleson and, and McWard and that group as you should. So, yeah. So like, so what that is, is the Canucks need to avoid at all costs being in a spot where they're playing fringe depth replacement level players on their blue line for significant or sustained stretches of time. It's still a blue line, even with Bear, though. And, and Bear had great numbers with Quinn Hughes, so they could go back to that. But it's still a blue line. Even if you added Bear, that's a lot of, like, number fives, isn't it? Isn't it? Like, there's not a – like, name the fourth defenseman on the Vancouver Canucks, and is he a true number four? Well, I think that's the root of the problem, and I think it's also the root of what the Canucks acknowledge is the problem and what they're trying to solve for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I, you know, I was talking to an NHL GM in the last couple of days who said, I would absolutely, this is, you know, apologies for the graphic reference, but he said, I would love to drop my drawers and shit out two defensemen right now, but I just can't, like, they don't exist. You can't get them anywhere. And so that sort of goes to show you how difficult it is to, to try and bring in legitimate top four guys, which is why going back to last year and the trade for Philip Peronic, I really praise the Canucks vision at a time in which they were getting absolutely hammered in your market for, Oh, what's the plan? Tell me these guys are flying by the seat of their pants. They just get this pick. It burns a hole in their pocket. Oh, this is how we react to the Bo Horvat trade. 
sounds like they had a pretty sound plan to me. Now, the next step in the process is going to be paying Philip Hironik on a contract that my guess is Canucks fans probably aren't going to love. But if you can nail down two of your four slots with a premier top five defenseman in the league and a partner that is not only the best partner he's ever played with in Van, but someone that very clearly makes him comfortable, I think that guy is worth his weight in gold. Do you think Rick Taka wants to split up Hughes and Roenick, ideally, and and find four guys he can trust? How he wanted to do it all through training camp and preseason until the Susie injury. I can't begin to speculate on what Rick Tockett thinks. I know personally, if it's working as well as it has been, it ain't broken, so don't try and fix it. Mm -hmm. And and I think you go out and try and fill the three and four spots any other which way you can. Moving along to uh, Corey Perry, uh, we mentioned it earlier in the week, uh, the most thorough story I've seen on this matter in Chicago with Por- with Perry was yours of a couple of days ago. So two-part question here. Do you think Perry and his agent, Pat Morris of Newport, are going to grieve? And this is this a PA matter that rises to the level, Frank, where with or without the cooperation of Perry and Morris, they may grieve just on the principle and the precedent of it all? I think they should. I think this is a fascinating crossroads for the NHL and NHL PA because I think really the undercurrent of all of this, and I think it's important to keep in mind the perspective of we still don't know exactly what Corey Perry did. We know that, as I reported, it was an alcohol-fueled incident, which he then alluded to with his discussion and and how he's seeking help for uh, alcohol abuse and also mental health, um, which I thought was an important way to sort of add context without telling us. And I've seen this commentary on social media, and as a complete aside, I'd just like to park it for one second. As a reporter... And as someone who has been in the mix on a million different stories, if I knew the dead nuts facts of this is exactly what happened and it was confirmed by someone, not secondhand, but someone that has direct knowledge of it, you can best believe that I would be reporting it. This is the same guy who quote unquote ruined the Seattle Kraken expansion draft. I'm here to report on the NHL and I'm here to report on all sorts of different ancillary connected things to it. And I'm not in anyone's pocket. So the the accusation that I got on social media was that I'm an insider and I'm playing nice with everyone. I don't really care. Just to park that for one second. Duly the next, noted. The next part is I don't know the facts. I have an idea. I've heard lots of rumblings and rumors and stories, but I don't, no one has confirmed it to me. So this kind of shrouds or clouds how I answer the question. And that's the reason why I explain it is because if we knew for certain, it would be a lot easier to say they got to get in there and, and do it now appeal now. But I think just from a pure precedent setting standpoint, because what the NHL has made it really clear to everyone watching is, Hey team, we support you in terminating contracts almost kind of for any reason now because, oh, we'll just go through the grievance process if it even comes to that, and then we'll come to a settlement. So Corey Perry's days with the Chicago Blackhawks are definitively over. He's never going to play for the team again. However, he may get some money back, but I don't think that's the way that it should be, and I think that's what the NHLPA has to stand up for, which is if you have committed something that the team believes to be inappropriate and or immoral, if it's not illegal, do you have you met the high threshold, the high bar for a contract to be terminated? And it's not important because Corey Perry's 38. He's had a Hall of Fame level career. And he's an easy guy on a one-year deal to throw out as a sacrificial lamb for a team that's trying to generate trust in the community again and is trying to build that. However, if something similar were to happen to a guy who has signed a $70 million contract extension and has, oh, by the way, maybe underperformed or hasn't played well, does this now open up the door for a team to get out from under a contract that they may not love at a time when salary cap dollars are so incredibly precious? Uh, And the other thing that we noted this week 
whatever Corey Perry did doesn't seem to have risen to the level of NHL discipline. Right? NHL right? discipline or something that the police or authorities would mm -hmm. be involved in as illegal. So then let me ask you this. Is it possible that it's already been a broker deal with Perry and Morris and they say you're going to take a termination of the standard player contract and you've got a chance to play another day? Otherwise, this, this, and this is taking place and it's going to be a lot messier for you? Well, I think the good part for Corey Perry is that because the way the CBA is structured, the NHLPA has 60 days from the date of termination, which I believe was Wednesday, to file a grievance. And as we've seen with Evander Kane and others, it's possible for Corey Perry to latch on somewhere else and right. then file the grievance, which would sort of allow him to, if you want to say, have his cake and eat it too. Yeah. But Mike Richards did that too. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Richards, Evander well, Kane, it. a lot of people have done it. But well, should the should the teams be allowed to terminate contracts? Right. And, and Frank, we noted, and you mentioned in your story, like. Slava Voinov spent 90 days in jail and got his money. So um, th this is quite interesting going forward here. Uh, uh, just to add one thing, I do think a few teams have already reached out to the Corey Perry camp. I think they are not in that mode yet where, where he is seeking help and is putting attention on trying to get to that point where he feels like he's made some positive steps forward in his life. But at the very least, teams have reached out to uh, want to understand well, what really did happen here? And if we were interested in bringing you in, what are some of the details that we would need to know? Do you think he plays again? I do. In the NHL? Yeah, you do. Well. Yep. Uh, lastly, our uh, our old friend, Mr. Gillis over there at the Augusta of Canada, of Victoria Golf Club, or the Pebble Beach of Canada mm -hmm. on the Vancouver Island, uh, is no longer going to be advising the NHLPA when his contract expires at the end of this month what happened there it's a good question i asked marty walsh on a sit down that i had that was posted uh, on the frankly speaking podcast this week I, I loved i've done 400 or 500 podcast episodes on different platforms and this is like one of my all-time favorite conversations one because marty walsh is a fantastically interesting guy two-term mayor of boston sitting u.s uh, Secretary of Labor, and I break the news that he's coming to the NHLPA on the day of the State of the Union. And that kind of overshadowed at least the news cycle for part of that day of Joe Biden's cabinet beginning to break up. And then he becomes designated survivor that night in a bunker somewhere in an undisclosed location in Washington, D.C. And Washington insider Frank Cervelli no is going to be joining Wolf Blitzer later today. <laughs> well, if I keep going with this gray hair, all I need to do is grow out a beard and I might just be on the show. Um, but it, he's a really interesting guy. And so the conversation is great. And he's got an unreal Boston accent, which you'll love. But with regard to Mike Gillis, I asked and he said basically – he's out and didn't give much context. And so what's fascinating for me is Mike Gillis was a finalist for that executive director job. And so was Matthew Schneider who had been at the PA for 12 years. And now both of those guys are out, which has allowed for a real consolidation of power for Ron Hainsey, who Marty Walsh hired in this position that had never existed before as existent assistant executive director. And so Mike Gillis was working really closely on group licensing deals and what the NHLPA's plan was for that going forward. He wielded a lot of influence there uh, as one of the sort of high ranking guys that not really a lot of people in the public knew about, but was really closely uh, counted on by Don Fear on all sorts of different matters. And so it's kind of abundantly obvious to me that Marty Walsh just wants to put his own people in place. And it was like out with the old, especially two guys that had been vying for the job. And now Mike Gillis and Matthew Schneider, free agents. At 65, mm -hmm. does, does Mike Gillis get attached to hockey again, do you think? I think he does. I think he's a really sharp guy that wants to impact things. Um, I don't know what that means moving forward, but if if I were a team... And now that I've had a real good chance over the last few years to understand how the Canucks work under ownership, 
and all the different pressure points. When you look back on his tenure, like it actually, it looks quite good in history, doesn't it? Yep. Like, mm-hmm. Of course, there were some missteps and mistakes made. And there isn't a GM in history who has gotten through a tenure without having some blemishes on his on his resume. But I think history should be awful kind to Mike Gillis and his tenure in terms of the overall grand scheme and picture and how it's viewed. Well, when you understand yeah. ownership here, as you said, do you understand yeah. what he had to uh, and uh, bend off? I, I'm sort of startled when you said 65, but it's his birthday today, actually. is 65 oh, today. There you go. And, uh, Marty's well, happy a, birthday in the news cycle. There you go. I do what uh, I can. And as you say, Marty Walsh has an amazing Boston accent. Don't they all, Frank? No, nah, like, not all they, of them. No? And some oh. of them are just straight up mass holes. So um, this was like... Oh, is Philly is talking here. Yeah, well... <laughs> Sixers playing the Celtics tonight? It had to come out at some point. Uh, but it's... I, I know, again, I'm I'm not trying to sell you on listening to my pod, but it's one of the favorite I've ever done. Awesome. Marvelous stuff. We'll catch up next Friday. See you guys. Happy hour on Sakaris and Price. Today's beer of the day, Yellow Dog's Chase My Tail Pale Ale. 